All right, so for this section, I'm going to talk a little bit about the diagnostic system we have in the onion. So, uh, diagnostics by that, I mean the systems we have for finding out why something is going wrong or generally generally what is going on in the onion, what is, what, what's it doing. Uh, the most basic one we have is the logging system. Uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, no. So so the logging system is all based around single log system um, that logs at a particular level. We have three levels, info, warning, and error. Uh, and uh, these are the channels for the functions that you call. These all call into the log function. So you call warning on a particular system. System here is just, system here is actually just a string. Uh, but it's wrapped in a type just so that the, the idea behind this is that, uh, for example, we want to tag all the unit, unit logging with, with the string unit. And so that we don't accidentally mistype that string, uh, we have a type for holding it and we put that at the top of the file. So we use a single type everywhere and not accidentally pass in a, uh, the wrong string. And these, these log messages, they will go to, to the console uh, over the console server connection, if you have a connected console. Uh, they will go to std out typically, so if you're running from the command line, you will see them directly in your command line window. Uh, you can enable file logging to uh, to get the output uh, into a file uh, that you can sort of examine uh, later if something goes wrong. Uh, if if the error is a, is a warning, if the message is a warning or an error, we will actually add a call stack to the message so you can find out exactly where in the code this happened. So the way it's used is typically something like this. As I said, you have, uh, you're declaring one of these system variables, which is basically just a string, but to avoid misspelling it, you declare it at the top of your file. And then you have some logging functions somewhere in the code that logs and then calls eprintf to print the formatted string. And here it's printing id strings with this uh, special format dot group that will cause the console to expand them, which I talked about earlier. Um, you might wonder about eprintf here, what's, what's that? That is our sort of error printing function. That's why it's called eprint. And the basic idea with it is that we have we want to have like a nice way of printing data without having to create the buffer and guess the right size of that buffer or allocating memory and, uh, and releasing uh, that memory for it later. And we want to be able to, uh, we want to be able to also kind of return these out of functions. So as you saw, like in the file system, we had, uh, we had a lot of, operations like the size operations or the open operations that return something wrapped in an error and the string in that error was just a char pointer. So that pointer can't point to like a local buffer because that buffer will go out of scope and the memory will disappear. So instead it's usually one of these, uh, it's usually memory that comes from this eprintf function. And how does that work? So, eprintf function um, has a critical section in it to prevent um, collisions. And then it just has a number of buffers. It has like, it has 16 different buffers that it uh, sort of rotates between. So whenever you print, uh, whenever you print with this, function, it will use one of these buffers, the buffer index, and then it will increase it. 
so the next time someone prints something, it will use the next buffer. So that means that whatever you print with this function uh, will stay around. And, and this, these buffers are static, so they're preserved in memory. So what you print will stay around in memory for a while. And you can print stuff that's too long because there's like a fixed, fixed size on these buffers. Uh, so you print something and it stays around in memory for a little while uh, until we've printed 16 other things and one of those will overwrite what we just printed. Uh, so this is, a, this is a kind of hacky solution or like a very hacky solution because we don't have, we don't really have any safeguards that we're not reusing this memory. Uh, it might very well be that through some through some strange coincidence, we are doing 16 of these prints before we actually use one of the sharp pointers, and then we'll get the wrong string. Uh, but even though this is kind of hacky, it works well in practice. Uh, doesn't lead to any problems. If it did lead to any problems, it wouldn't be super serious. It would mostly be like, oh, we're printing the wrong string somewhere. But even that, I've, I've, never, seen, I've never seen that happen. And it's, it's a nice way to avoid this problem because if we had to allocate memory, then we would have to allocate that using some allocator. We would have to return the error string together with the allocator so that someone could free that later at some point and it would be easy to forget to free that. So, so this really saves a lot of headache, even though it's not 100% safe, but works in practice. So um, asserts. Uh, we have a lot of asserts in the code and just for for asserting that we're in a good state and our asserts are implemented as macros so they have some kind of test they only run in development in release mode we skip them for performance uh, but in development they test some tests and if the test fails we will report uh, an assert an assert failure. Report the line and the file number and the test that failed and any other arguments that were passed. Uh, this is actually a variotic macro and these arguments will be passed into an ePrintf function so you can use string formatting there. Um, there's also an xensure uh, which is the same as xassert but it doesn't have any message. The idea behind xensure is that it should never fail. These are like well if this fails you you have like your belief of what the program is doing is wrong. So the code needs to be fixed, essentially, if this fails. While this can sometimes fail based on bad data or something like that. Uh, so if one of these asserts triggers, we write a log message, which has uh, our call stack, our ending call stack, our Lua call stack, and some other information. Basically, the stuff you need in order to debug and, and find, find the problem that triggered this assert. And we do the same thing for, for access violations. We capture structured exceptions on Windows and, and do the same kind of printing for them. Um, we have the profiler. The profiler is used to, to measure Indian performance. And it does it through explicit profiling scopes that are put into the code. So whenever you have some function uh, that you want to know how much time it takes, you put one of these profiling scopes uh, in that function. So typically you have that in all functions that you sort of suspect to be a little bit expensive. Uh, what this profiling scope will do, it will access a thread local thread profiler that keeps profiling data for a particular thread. It will register uh, at the, in the constructor here, it will start a new profiling scope and it and record the time for that. And when this goes out of scope and gets destroyed, it will record an end of scope. So it will record the, the start time and the stop time for this scope. And from that, we can sort of, uh, we can figure out how much time it took. And we keep track of nested scopes. So if you have, if this calls out to some other function, then it has a profile, we can display that in a nice, uh, nice nested graph. And this, Scopes that get recorded uh, The scopes that get recorded 
um, the events that get recorded, they look just like this. It's a profiler event. It's like a type flag, and then it has pointed to the name of the scope and uh, some timing information. And when we, so we have a thread profiler for each thread, but whenever, whenever that thread exits to its root scope, so whenever, whenever we exit a profiler scope and there is no other profiler scope around it, the thread profiler will send its data to a global profiler, so it will sync its data uh, with the global profiler class. We, do, we don't want to record into the global profiler class because then we would have to take locks everywhere and it would be super inefficient. So this way we only need to take a lock at this specific synchronization point. Uh, and this global profiler in turn sends the profiler data to WebSocket clients that are connected at this WebSocket address at slash profiler. They will get fed these, these profiler scopes and then they can analyze it however they want. They can present it in some useful way. Um, we have this in the old console. We have a profiler tool for displaying this. Uh, we've also written some, some web-based tools that, that connect, uh, connect from JavaScript and, and, and just parses the profiling data and displays it using JavaScript code. Uh, one thing to note here is how we treat strings in the profiler. Uh, we don't want to save this string in the profiler event because strings are, as we know, they're messy, they're variable size, they're, um, uh, yeah, they're variable size, they can use a lot of memory and so on. And we'll have a lot of these profiler scopes. We'll create them all the time. So what we do instead is that we record just the pointer to the string. So we record just the char pointer. And that's really all we need because the profiler scope, the profiler scopes here only use static strings. So this, this memory will always be there. So we can just follow the pointer to see the memory. And when we talk to, when we talk to a tool over this connection, we, we send the, we send the structs just to say, look, with the raw pointers. And then we send the table, um, on the WebSocket that sort of specifies, well, this is how these pointers should be translated into strings. So we keep track of which strings we've already told the WebSocket about so that we only need to tell it about new strings that, that were encountered and, and what they mean. So one thing you might ask about this profiling system, is it, is, is it really necessary? Can't we just use a sampling profiler and then, then we don't have to do, we don't have to do explicit uh, instrumentation of scopes. We, we get like instrumentation, all the functions and it's kind of more convenient. But I think this still is useful like uh, in combination with that. Because a sampling profiler is typically tends to be used only by programmers to sort of it's kind of an, a bit of work to set up a session and, and do do a record and so on. While as with this scope, um, uh, with this with this system, it's pretty easy to look at. Um, even for someone who who isn't a programmer, you don't have to set up a special build to do this. You just just run the game and you can look at, you, you can see some quick statistics of how the most important functions are performing, like how much time are you spending on rendering, how much time are you spending on updating your world and so on. So, so I still think this instrumented profile is, is really useful even if you have access to a sampling profiler. Yeah, I would say that all of the platforms that we operate on provide a, a sampling profiler, so it kind of already be redundant work to implement that. And then there's also the fact that they don't all provide nice uh, visual scope profilers like this. I think it's a nice complement to the yeah. Vision platforms. No, I agree. Uh, so the final thing that I'm I'm not going to say that much about this. We have a graph drawing tool uh, that can be used to to draw overlays over the over the onion. Uh, so this uh, this system has some hard coded overlays in it uh, for drawing for drawing graphs of how a particular 
how the FPS is changing every frame, stuff like that. Uh, and and these graph drawing tools are all launched from the console, so you can bring up a graph of something uh, through a console command, and you get a nice uh, nice drawing of that. Uh, and this also provides the the render overlay information that you can trigger from the console, where you see how many how many meshes we are rendering, how many times we're how much time we're spending in different parts of the renderer, and so on. But that's more an a rendering issue, so I'm not going to go into that either. Um, so that's it. Any questions about this? Um, yeah, a bit. Um, a question regarding you know, the e-printf stuff and the, and the log. Mm. Um, it seems to me that then this um, tells about what kind of pattern uh, is used in the engine regarding uh, error reporting. Let's say I have a function that returns an error template thing, right, with a value and a, and a message, if I remember well. Uh, does that mean that I, if I write that function that can, you know, trigger an error, I should return that and not necessarily log from within my function, right? Yeah, and I mean... Let the caller, um, Decide yeah, that's that's talk. like uh, that's like an API design thing, and it's 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 done differently in different systems, and it it basically it's up to what kind of what kind of API uh, you want. Typically, some we have some systems that uh, some systems. To, I, w I would say that we've sort of done, done a bit of a journey with the engine. Like it used to be that we had hard asserts everywhere and we, and we rarely ever returned any errors. Uh, we had like a philosophy like, well, if you've done something wrong, it's better that we blow up and you will know that you've done something totally wrong and you'll have to fix it. But that kind of philosophy doesn't work very well the way our engine operates with our tools these days because the the engine is the viewport for the tool. And if you can't run the engine because the engine thinks something is wrong, then you can't really edit the data very well because the engine is, is the viewport, so you can't really access the data, which makes it harder to fix problems. So we've kind of been moving from a philosophy of, well, we should just blow up the engine as fast as possible to like, no, we should really, we should really try to keep running and and get like useful error messages up to the user. So most of these most of these functions in like earlier versions of the engine, they would re just return a bool, and if there was an error, it would assert or or perhaps log an error message and, and return false or something like that. Uh, but now we sort of clean this up and and have a bit more proper error handling here, so you can reason about errors. Uh, but I wouldn't say that there are that many systems where we do that. It's typically only when we when we interact with stuff that can be that we have like limited control over, like the file system on Windows. We have very limited control. Windows can suddenly decide that the file is locked, and we don't know who locked it or why, and there's nothing we can do really. So, so those kinds of things we need to treat as errors. And the other thing is like user input, like JSON files. If we have problems parsing the JSON file or, is, or, or if there's data error in our input files, uh, those are also propagated as errors. But most of the other stuff, like in the runtime, where it's all our stuff and not really uh, the user stuff, uh, we don't do, we just assert on an error. The difference is the Lua API, of course. There, there we will generate a Lua error so that uh, so that uh, that doesn't crash the application that just produces a low error that the user can fix and continue yeah but just just one, 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 to dig into that let, let's say we take this uh, ease directory and for some we know windows you know has locked something that you know you are in error state right yeah um when we look at this api can we expect ease directory to log uh, to call the, the log function on no, the, no. The functions. Okay. If the function returns an error, that means it won't log. Okay. If, if it returns an error, then the caller is responsible for logging. 
Okay, thanks. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Nice.